that which is uh, uh, concordant versus that which is discordant is only known in terms of how it's relating to the sounds, if you will, around it, to use a music metaphor. So the way I tune my guitar, for instance, is to listen to how it sounds next to other chords so that they resonate together, so that they, they sound like they are getting along versus the discord that you hear when something's out of tune. Welcome back to Deep in Christ. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here at the Coming Home Network International, bringing to you another conversation about this, our daily task of growing in imitation of and relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to be with you again. I'm joined once again by my good friend and colleague, Kenny Burchard, the Director of Development here at the Coming Home Network International. Uh, Kenny, it's good to be with you again, brother, to continue this conversation about virtue and unity. Yeah, good to be with you too. Last time I was uh, visiting you from Central California Command Center, so I'm I'm back home now. But but really really great <laughs> to, to have be you with back. you again. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, excited to continue this conversation. Um, I'll I'll bring us up to speed a little bit before we launch into today's topic. I mean, last last time we talked about uh, prudence and humility in particular. We kind of we kind of transitioned from our conversation about unity, pivoting to uh, the virtues to talk about how how on an individual level. Uh, how does our character, our disposition, contribute to the unity or disunity of the body of Christ? Um, and virtue is this this primary lens that we're looking at this through. And so we we started last week by talking about prudence. And again, this is yet another uh, excuse for me to also talk through the structure of the virtues, which I'm I'm pretty big fan of. But there's a particular order to them, and we really saw that last week on how. Uh, I mean, it's it's in some sense a truism to say, yes, my character contributes to the unity or disunity in the body of Christ. But as we dig into the structure of the virtues as it's been received and, and synthesized and developed by the church, we see that there's a lot more there's a lot more to that. And looking at prudence as this foundation stone of conversion of virtue is a really important one because we as we saw last week, prudence is this conversion to truth, this turning to reality, deciding to be the, a person who first and foremost wants to know what is true and what is real, wants to act in accord with what is real. And we link that to Christ's words there at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark saying, you know, be converted and accept the gospel. In other words, you you need, you, there's this fundamental conversion that has to occur first if you are to accept any of the rest of what Christ wants to speak to you and do to you and do through you. And so prudence and humility, we talked about how those uh, are involved in this fundamental conversion, this turning towards the truth. And so mm. when we left us last week, one of the things that we were sort of turning to is then, okay, so we I want to be a person of truth. I'm, I'm going to open myself up to truth. I'm going to look in the dark places of my life. I'm going to go to prayer and kind of be open to God showing me uh, the truths, especially those that I'm not quite ready to see. Uh, I'm going to w- walk by whatever light that he gives me. But then the question is, well, what do I do? Like, what do I tend to first? What do I, you know, there's a million things I could focus on and attend to. Uh, and that b- brings us to our next virtue, you know, the, the thing that prudence turns to, and that is this virtue of justice. And the the quick the, the, the way I like to summarize justice, I mean, there's there's many definitions, many ways to talk about it, and we'll we'll go through some qu- our favorite quotes, you know, that that kind of flesh it out a little bit. But the simplest way that I like to think about justice is that if prudence is a turning to reality, one of the primary, most fundamental, most practical realities that prudence turns to is the reality that I am a person in relationship with other persons. That's the most practical practicable reality in reality, right? There's lots of truths. This is a table, two plus two equals four, et cetera. There's many truths, but the most practical truths are the truths that obligate me to act in a certain way. And so I am a person. I, I, dis, I discover that about myself. I'm a conscious being. I have a creator. I myself have a mother and a father and brothers. I now have a spouse. I have six children. I have an employer. I have employees. 
I am a person who lives in a web of relationships with other persons. And those relationships aren't things that I merely make up or I determine for myself. They're real. They have real qualities, just as persons have real natures and qualities. And the simplest way to explain justice is that am I going to be a person who acts in accord with the nature of personhood and and the relationships that I'm in? The last thing that you said there, it really resonates with what I was thinking. And there'll be a lot of uh, metaphors, a lot of word pictures uh, in this <laughs> yeah. discussion, I think, that because this theme of justice and and really righteousness is is, is the biblical word. Uh, the justice and righteousness are both used together. But you, you said accord, accord. And uh, there are other chord-rooted uh, words here, discordant and concordant. And it's really this picture, you know, the fact that you brought in relationships, I think, is really helpful right out of the gate here, because that which is uh, uh, concordant versus that which is discordant is only known in terms of how it's relating to the sounds, if you will, around it, to use a music metaphor. So the way I tune my guitar, for instance, is to listen to how it sounds next to other chords so that they resonate together so that they they sound like they are getting along versus the discord that you hear when something's out of tune. I think just right out of the gate, that's a really good way of thinking about righteousness. Um, this isn't something just can, that can be done through introspection. Like in order right. to think about righteousness and justice, I have to look at myself in relationship to yeah. the other people around me, to God, to his son, our Lord, and to my fellow humans. There is where I'll find out if I'm out of tune uh, uh, right. or un unjust, if you will. Yeah, morality is a, is a fundamentally personal kind of a thing, right? Mm -hmm. Rocks rocks aren't just or imprudent or courageous or, or you know, lacking in self-control. You know, rocks and plants and animals, they, they stand outside of this moral world that we as, mm -hmm. as humans inhabit. And it's because we're personal beings and because, as you said, we, we are in relationship with other persons. And we can't, we can't get rid of those relationships, right? They, they're, cause, because we didn't make them, right? We enter into some of them, but some of them we don't. Like we didn't choose to be created. We have a creator who's given us everything we have. That relationship is there. And so, I mean, a classical definition of justice is to give each person their due, you know, and so we have specific relationships, you know, our marriages and our, you know, our familial relationships and our, our contractual, you know, legal relationships that we enter into. But then we have just the general relationship of human being to human being, person to other person. And we we recognize that on some fundamental level, every human being has certain things that are due to them. They're, they're due love. Um, every person deserves to be loved as a, as a child of God because of the kind of being they are. And so, again, imprudence is turning to the, the reality of the universe, the reality of God's creation, the reality of personhood, the reality of the relationship between those persons. Justice is this, is this decision. Again, we're talking about virtue here. So it's a, it's a habit of soul, a disposition, a, a practice that becomes part of who you are of attending to those relationships and acting rightly in accord with, with them. Let me read uh, quickly the a little bit from the catechism here, and you can comment further here, Kenny. This is mm -hmm. paragraph 1807. It's in the section on the virtues. We read uh, the bit about prudence last time. This is now about justice. It reads, justice is the moral virtue that consists in the constant and firm will to give their due to God and neighbor. Justice toward God is called the virtue of religion. Justice towards men disposes one to respect the rights of each and to establish in human relationships the harmony that promotes equity with regard to persons and the common good. The just man, often mentioned in the sacred scriptures, is distinguished by habitual right thinking and the uprightness of his conduct toward his neighbor. Yeah, that's so good. And, uh, you know, these are concepts right out of the gate that uh, the longer we go, uh, especially in the West, the harder it is to find, you know, good discussions about things like duty, um, which I know we're, we're going to go beyond that, but this is a, this is a starting place for the idea of justice or righteousness in the framework of relationships. And we even as we as Catholics, when we celebrate and we worship the Lord, right as as uh, the celebration of the Eucharist begins, 
uh, one of the first things that happens is we start to talk about this theme of justice with respect to our relationship with God and what we're about to do. And um, the priest presiding says, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We and So let us give something to God. This is what you're saying in the catechism, giving what belongs to the other. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We say, it is right and just. <laughs> like That's what God deserves. Uh, the Father says, it truly is right and just, our duty and our salvation. In other words, Without aligning ourselves to what is just and what God deserves and has coming to him from us, there's no possibility that we are going to be in the salvation part of what God uh, is doing in the world. So it, it really um, is important that we get this justice theme right, especially in, in the sense that it relates to God and others. That, yeah, that's really good, Kenny. And I, I love that. Again, I love those lines from the Mass. It's right and just. It's truly right and just. Uh, one of the things that we we recognize here in this virtue of justice, while while we're talking through the, the, the cardinal virtues, and we'll also kind of visit the theological virtues at the end once we get there, while we're talking about the four and now we're on to justice, there is a way, if we look at these as a whole, as kind of a, a, a body, you know, a, a whole structure in the virtues, there's a sense in which justice is the peak. It's the heart of the, the heart of the matter. Joseph Pieper, mm -hmm. Pieper writes, while prudence is the cornerstone of the cardinal virtues, justice is their peak and culmination. A good man is above all a just man. Justice really gives the, the content to the whole of the virtues, the content to morality. When we talk about, uh, again, being a righteous man, being a good person, doing what is right. Well, the content there is of justice. Prudence is sort of this turning towards it, and we'll get on to courage and temperance and self-control later on how they support it. But really the heart of the matter is justice, that if we weren't persons in relationship with other persons, then this would just wouldn't be an issue. You know, morality wouldn't be a thing. There wouldn't be anything to, to do, but it's because we are in relationship. And of course, justice to God, justice with relation to to God, our creator. That's the highest relationship. And that brings us to, you know, an aspect of justice here that's really helpful to this, I think, the whole conversation. We touched on it at the end of last episode, but that is that justice um, begins to also give us an order to how we go about doing what is right and, and discerning what is right. We're in relationships, uh, but there is a certain hierarchy in those relationships. God is definitively at the top of that hierarchy. When we think about, you know, who is the person that we have to give the, our highest and our, our utmost to, it is our creator. It is the almighty God. And then we recognize in our lives that, you know, even with our human relationships, there's a hierarchy there. I mean, we've, 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 we're both married men now. And so our spouse is right up there, <laughs> you know, right after God, you Fact. know, it was that we've <laughs> promised our whole life. We've bounded up with this, this other person uh, to serve them and to take care of them and to help them also to do justice with regards to God. And then, of course, we have our, our children and our families and our, our, our jobs, our roles and all that. And, and the rest of that, it's part of a, the continuing practice and honing of the virtue of justice that we work out the, the hierarchy there and we t tend to it and we, we reorient and reorganize things if they get out of order. But this just the question of order itself is, I think, an important uh, piece of this whole puzzle here, that when we, we turn to what is real and when we recognize the reality of relationships and and that they they create these obligations, these duties, this this rightness that we want to attend to. There's an order there, and part of growing the virtue of justice is practicing it, but also discerning that order and getting better and better at instantiating that order in our lives and in our, and, and reflected in our you know in our schedules, our routines, the way that we organize our life. Does it reflect the true hierarchy of goods uh, in in the virtue of justice? It all reminds me of something that happened to me when I was a kid. Um, John Mark, another another metaphor and a word picture that really just fits right in here. Because we're talking about unity. Like this whole discussion, this whole yeah. series that you've started here is about the, the call that we have to unity as the people of God, to be in union, communion with God himself, and to one another as brother and sis brothers and sisters in Christ. 
and how justice works with that. So it, it reminds me of when I was a little kid and I had, I used to be one of these guys that would jump my bike off of ramps that I would make. I'd set up some bricks and a piece of plywood and I would <laughs> jump my bike. Did you ever do that? <laughs> oh yeah. It's like a scene out of, uh, I live to tell uh, about it. <laughs> yeah. It was a scene out of what's that dumb movie of, um, um, uh, Napoleon dynamite. Anyway, so I would jump my, I would jump my bike off of these little dumb ramps I would make in the neighborhood. And, and then I would try to land on the back wheel and, you know, pop a wheelie. Well, what started happening is the back rim of my bike got bent like really badly. (laughs) It got like to the point where when I would, when I would roll down the street, it would go zit, 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 you know, against the frame because it was bent. Well, so then my dad, I said, what am I going to do about this, this rim? He said, well, you can either get a new one or you can take that one to the shop and have it. And then he used this word, trued up. And I don't know if people in bike shops still use that language, but he said, you need to have the rim trued up. So we took the bike to the bike shop. The guy puts it on this machine and the machine has on either side these immovable blocks that are gripping the side of the tire. And then he just starts wrenching this rim through these immovable blocks so that the tire trues itself back into the shape that the blocks want it to be in. And I think that's like, that's one of the ways we can know if we've got an injustice problem or an unrighteousness problem in our lives. If we're like someone in our life is rubbing us the wrong way, as it were, and then we need to get trued up. And, and the, the being trued up has to do with, with putting ourselves into contact with God's immovable goodness, his immovable righteousness, and letting that do its painful good work on us until, till that sound is gone. That zit, 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 zit sound is gone. So everything you yeah. just said just reminded me of that scene from my childhood. We need to get trued yeah. up. <laughs> totally. And I, I, li- I like that metaphor. And because, because, yeah. Again, one of the interesting things about justice is that there is this order. Um, and that when, when you have a problem in, in life, like one thing that you'll find, uh, I think just find practically experientially is that when there's an issue, refer to the higher level of order, right? If you're having right. an issue down here, make sure that the next level of relationship that, that it kind of comes before it is, is right and true. I mean, when you're having a difficulty in your marriage, make sure that your relationship with God is right. You know, when, if you're having a, an issue with your relationship with your kids, make sure that your, your things are going well with your spouse. There is yeah. a certain trickle effect of grace down this hierarchy of relationship in the virtue of justice. And, and again, part of keeping that whole wheel of justice tuned up in your life is putting those things back in order. And and when you recognize something has gotten out of order, like, hey, I've been working on these relationships, but I've sort of let this higher, more important one slip slip away, well, then it's a little bit of a – it's a bit of a wrenching process to put things back in their place. But once yes. they do, then the grace flows again. It, it reminds me a bit of uh, C.S. Lewis's first things principle that if we if we put second things first, you know, if we put mm. uh, secondarily important things in the highest place, we we end up losing both, right? It destroys them both, both first things and second things. But when we keep first things, highest priority things in their place, then it there's a there's a flowing of grace down through them. They all find their proper place and they all are energized. And so that's part of this this virtue here. And, and if we think about the ways that that fails to happen, we can see that a lot of the the sources of conflict, the sources of sin in our own life, and then really the you know the sources of disunity in the church, you know, uh, they're manifold, they're manifold in their in their source and their reason. But a lot of it comes down to it's not that people are most of the time pursuing specific evils. I mean, sometimes people are very malicious, but a lot of times injustice arises not from people pursuing specific evils, but pursuing goods in an improper order, elevating a lower good above what should be a higher uh, duty, right? Uh, and uh, I mean, unity itself, I think, is is one of these, right? The unity of a marriage, the unity of the church, these are important things. And it's not that other things are unimportant scandal, you know, when someone's not behaving the way they ought to, when there's a problem, yes. when there's a difficulty in the church, in the body of Christ. Uh, and, and I brought up marriage because I think it's a good analogy there. But 
the the unity of the church is not something to be trifled with, right? Yeah, it's it's not uh, to, even to elevate. Um, so, I, well, well, I won't I won't go too far ahead there. But the the point is is that that order is really important, and putting mm. things in their in their proper order sometimes is a painful process. But when we let them get out of order, when we elevate uh, lower goods to a higher place, that's um, that's a source of sin, but that's also specifically a source of division amongst different people when they've allowed the the hierarchy of goods in their lives and how they see the church and their and their selves and the people around them. When those get out of order, that creates this disunity amongst people for sure. Yeah, yeah, amen. So good. Yeah, and so I think that that process too. I mean. One of the things we want to talk about here with regards to justice, we sort of talked about kind of the essence of what it is, but recognizing that as a virtue, it's something that we grow in o- over time as we practice it. So you you begin trying to put these things in order in your lives, putting God first, you know, getting your your basic um, duty to God in its place, you know, going going to mass, trying to be a moral person, praying, those sorts of things. And then beginning to organize the other relationships, it takes practice. But as we as we do it, it becomes more of who we are. To be a person of justice uh, becomes a part of our, our very character. It becomes easier. It becomes delightful over you know over time. You become a person who loves justice, like God. That's this way that we grow in imitation of Christ. That we begin to love justice, love turning to relationship and acting in accord with it. So it's not just that it happens once, it's that it's something that we grow in and we develop in over time as we practice it. Yeah, so good. I, I think probably just the last thought I would share before we plow ahead there is learning to grow in justice is that it really is seen. This is kind of putting a, an, an exclamation mark or a period at the end of everything you've shared, John Mark, and that righteousness or justice really is seen in the context of relationships. Um, It's how I know how I'm doing, as it were. And I used to joke with people, you know, back when I was pastoring, and they'd say, I just don't know if I'm growing, you know, in righteousness. And I'd say, well, just go walk around Walmart, you know, for 20 minutes and interact with people and you'll know how you're doing, you know, like, <laughs> like or go, go talk to your wife or go, go ask your wife how you're doing, you know, like it's, it's other people that are, are the mirrors that through which we see how we're doing. And, and, and this is why I think it's so connected to unity in the body of Christ. These, these themes of unity and righteousness and relationships, they are all tied together. Yeah. Well, let's let's turn that direction now. I, we've fleshed it out a bit. I'm sure we will do so more as we go here. But let, let's talk about some of the ways then that um, again the life of virtue, the the individuals engaging in this ongoing conversion um, that the virtues describe, how that's connected to unity and disunity in the church. And I, I already touched on one aspect, and so I'll reiterate it. And that is that you know in injustice or un. un- <laughs> Yeah, injustice, unjust, being unjust. Yeah. Um, it's it's either to you know w- to fail to to give to a person their due, what is due to God, what is due to your spouse, what is due to the to the, the church as the body of Christ to God through His church. Um, it's to to fail to do that, but but I think a, a connected way, an additional way of failing in the virtue of justice, that's I think much more common, much more subtle. And much more at the root of the specific issue of disunity is when we we're, we're pursuing goods, but we're pursuing them in a, in a wrong order. I mean, think many of the times we've had scandals in the church when we've had not scandals when we've had disunity in the church, when we've had schism, when we've had arguments mm-hmm. in the church. You have a lot of good, like otherwise good and sincere people who are disagreeing over over issues, uh, and they're they're seeing they're seeing goods. They're valuing good things that they want to emphasize. You know, they're eschewing evil things that need to be eschewed, right? But then, in terms of what they do about that, um, mm-hmm. they they allow the order of justice to get out of order. And again, I, I we never never pointing fingers out there. I mean, this happens to us all the time. Whenever we get on the internet and we begin to complain about what's going on in the church, we're doing this, right? We're we're turning away from our duties to live out the Christian life. And we are worrying about what's going on in the church. We're worrying about some scandal. We're worrying about 
you know, what somebody else is getting wrong. And there's a fundamental un- injustice when we do that because it's not that there's it's not that we're trying to do evil, right? We're concerned about evil things. We want them to be put to right, but we are so often turning away from what God's given us to do to pursue some other good that's not really ours to, to bother with. So this is not mm-hmm. uh, an isolated issue. This is something we all struggle with. But this kind of injustice, this allowing our priority list to get out of order is I think one of the at at the at the root of so much, so many instances, uh, and ongoing disunity that occurs in the body of Christ. Yeah, it is, and I think of this word. Words are just so much a part of this whole discussion yes, that they yes. they work to help us see what we what our options are. So, f- for instance, if I see, like you say, on the internet, you know, all the fights going on about. Bad, bad things people are doing as as followers of yeah. Jesus, not following Jesus the right way. Well, I have a choice there. And t- typically, people are not going to just be passive spectators. Um, typically, they're going to take some kind of action that's either going to help or hurt what's what's already wrong. And the word that we need, you know, um, uh, to participate in good, you know, injustice and in righteousness is the word repair. You just think about that word for a second, repair, you know, to, to put things back together the way they belong. And sometimes the, the intuition that we have in our brokenness is to split things apart, to disengage, to tear things away from each other. You know, I, re- I remember John Mark when I first started talking to the Coming Home Network as a non-Catholic in a, an appointment that I had with Ken Hensley, who, who cares for pastors that come into the church. And I was talking to him about this. And what, it, what happens when it's just so bad and things are so bad? Shouldn't you split and shouldn't you divide? And he said, you don't find that in Scripture. You, know, you never find in Scripture um, God's people <coughs> going off and starting a new a whole new Israel because this Israel got it wrong. Well, we'll be, we'll be the good Israel, and they'll be the bad. They're the bad Israel. We're the good Israel. Like you see, God working to bring about the healing of His people internally. And was it yeah. was it Saint Francis of Assisi who heard the Holy Spirit say, "Repair my church"? Was that was that the word that was used? Repair my church <laughs> that's that's in shambles or something like that. So this whole idea of how to deal with disunity. The way to deal with it is to repair things, um, to put things back together with mm-hmm. each other the way they actually belong rather than participating mm-hmm. in tearing things apart more. It can be done with words, can be do, done with attitudes, and we just have to be so careful. Yeah. And again, justice always has this turning to these different there's there's a variety of of hierarchies of goods that it has us turn to and acknowledge. Then we think about a relationship with another person. We recognize that like the, the highest thing in that relationship is is our is love for that person, right? Not not correcting them, correcting them is maybe a, is an expression of love. It's how that love is carried out, but it it has to be love, right? If they're doing something wrong and I want and I need to. I ought to ex- exhort them or correct them or work with them. I always have to make sure that it's rooted in love. And so often in our relationships, whether it's with our spouses or our children or with other Christians that we're disagreeing with, we, we're, we're, we're grasping for goods, things that we, we believe are good and they, they are good uh, or they can be good, like correcting and you know, refuting or, or, or helping uh, a person who we believe has gone astray. But as soon as we, lo- we lose love in the highest spot of our regard for that person, then our, our truth-telling becomes simply trying to win, to win a battle. Our, our correcting simply become, becomes vanity or, or fighting or, or anger. And so in our relationship with that person, there's a hierarchy of goods there. And justice always helps us you know, look at that relationship and say, am I putting the highest thing in the highest place? Which is, I love that person. I try to love that person as God does. And only in the context of that love do then I, I try, uh, you know, in the right way, in the right time, and <laughs> with the right words to correct them and to direct them in the right direction. It has to be based in love. And then, but even like more fundamentally still, like I look in my own life and, and the question is, um, 
again, if I'm not practicing justice, if I'm not being a just person, then my ability to love, my ability to correct or help that person is going to be, is going to be uh, goofed up, right? If I'm not a person of prayer, but I'm presuming to be a person who's speaking truth to the heretics, it's just not going to work, right? It just doesn't work that way. Um, there is a, there is a connection there. My ability to be a bearer of truth in love is dependent on whether I'm being a person of a person of justice. There's no division. There's no divorce between those two parts of my life. They're all one thing. And so, once again, like I have, <laughs> there's all these levels in which I need to be practicing justice, putting things, as you said, repairing, putting things back in their proper place. And if I'm not mm-hmm. a person who is rooted in prayer who is making sure that the foundation of my life is turning to God first and being open to him and being healed by him and being submissive to his will and his truth and goodness and beauty, then it's always this presumption. It's always this misstep to go out there and presume that I'm going to fix the church or I'm going to correct this brother in Christ. I have to be practicing justice with regards to God. And then he can open doors for me to uh, re- to repair these other relationships that I'm in. Yeah. I was just thinking that this is why I think it's so good, you know, even when we're together celebrating uh, in the Mass, that uh, an integral part of what we do as Christians is we pray for the church from all different angles. Uh, And that's so good because it's really hard to hate somebody and and live in discord with somebody that you're praying for. (laughs) Right. So, so the church calls us and even embeds into our worship prayer. We pray for the Holy Father. We pray for our bishops. We pray for our priests and our deacons. We pray for the whole people of God. We pray for government leaders. Um, we pray for th- those in our parish and our congregations. Why? Well, those are all the people we could have problems with. <laughs> <laughs> they're yeah. uh, just them just them uh n- nobody else just everybody and so so here we are you know like even paul is saying in in his letter to timothy i want men everywhere to pray lifting up holy hands without wrath you know and and pray and then he starts moving down the list for all these people so that you can live um quiet and peaceable life what in all godliness so somehow part of justice in in its relationship to the unity of the body of Christ is hammered out, trued up in prayer. Yeah. It just is. Right. And it's the, it can be really painful. I think about marriage counseling sometimes when I would do, used to do that and couples would just be at each other's throats. I don't know what to do. And I'd say, well, just pray for him or pray for her. Oh my gosh. I can't do that. <laughs> you know, well, Man, if you can't just do at least that much, then you're never going to get all this other stuff healed up. So I, I love that you're, you know, you're kind of pushing on this, like almost as a question, are you praying for the people yeah. that you're irritated with or that you see doing the thing that shouldn't be done? Yeah, G.K. Chesterton reminds us that Christ uh, Christ said that we need to you know, love our neighbor and love our enemy because oftentimes they're the same person. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. We have these these twin yeah. exhortations. But but lo- you know, loving so God you know, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. I mean, these really this these this encompasses justice. This is what justice is. Because that covers all the possible relationships we can be in, God and then our, our fellow uh, human beings. Um and uh, loving our neighbor, you know, it's interesting to think that you know, justice to my neighbor, it's a matter of justice to that person, but also to God Himself too, because God, my Creator, has commanded me to do so. It is His will. So it's a it's a double act of justice when I love my neighbor, when I pray for my neighbor, because I'm I'm doing what is right with regards to that person, but also I am doing the will of God. And this is another reason I think that, again, that prayer for another person, especially a person that I disagree with or I have a problem with, has to be the foundation because um, I might be leaping over trying to be in the will of God, trying to carry out the will of God if I try to f- to fix that person, but I'm not praying for them. Maybe I'm trying mm-hmm. to fix them apart from God, which is which is a big no-no. It's not going to work. We we've been reading the Screw Tape Letters as a as a team here at the Coming Home Network International, and there's that there's that one chapter where the Screw Tape, the the tempter, the the, the devil there, 
is is talking about how you know he wants to get this Christian guy to uh, pray for his mother's soul, but not for her rheumatism. In other words, he he wants to kind of drive. He, he wants to find ways to have this man be concerned with this person and her issues and her problems and her sins, but not love her. And true prayer, when we really go back to God and we truly pray for another person, for their good. We try to see them as God sees them. We try to love them as God loves them. It it sets aside our often petty, you know, disagreements with them or what we think is best. And we invite God to replace it with what he thinks is best. Who does he say that these people are? Who what does he say that unity is? What does he say that the church is? What is what does he say about me and about the people around me? And so when we pray, again, as you said, when we pray for other people, especially people we disagree with, we're inviting God to, to replace our will, which is often broken and, and mixed. We have mixed motives, mixed purposes, and replace it with his will. If I'm going to be an agent of, of change, of unity, of repair in the body of Christ, I only want it to be that I'm, I'm carrying out God's will in me and never, never apart from him. Yeah, that's so good. And I just, this cruciform image, you know, flashes into my mind I, as I hear the words of Jesus, you know, love your enemies and pray for them. Uh, yes. You could almost say, love your enemies, which begins by praying f- for them. Another way of thinking about how to sort of kickstart that process of loving your enemies. Right. But then, oh, well, but that's hard, Jesus. How? How? Well, let me show you. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is the prayer of the just man, the good man, from the cross, uh, upon the prayer upon those who are murdering him, who are doing the, that which is unjust to him. Oh, like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like this. This is how you. This is how you love your enemies and pray for them. It's when, it's it's not when they're doing their worst out there. Often it's it's when the worst that can come out of their life kind of bumps into your life, and then. Uh, you have a choice to make. You know, what do I do right now? And hey, this stuff is not easy, John Mark. I mean, if it was, the church would not be fractured. We wouldn't have all this division. We wouldn't have a history of, of schism in the world. This is the hard stuff. This is the, mm-hmm. but this is what it means to follow Jesus. Right. In the virtue of justice on an individual level, it's, one thing we we recognize about it, and we need to recognize it ahead of time, because sometimes we get in situations and it's hard to hard to see them rightly. But justice is this great act of faith in God, right? To decide to be a person of justice, to do justice, often means setting aside in the moment what I want to be true, what I want to focus on, the goods that I want to pursue, the the issues that I desperately want to put right. But it's to set that aside and to receive from God his order, his hierarchy of goods. You know, there, there's so many times, on the most basic level, there's so many times when we want to keep working, but it's time to pray. You know, I, there's more good that I can do, God, but it's the Sabbath. So do I put aside my work or not? And putting aside your work on the Sabbath day is a fundamental act of justice and a fundamental act of faith in God because you're saying, Lord, there is good that I want to do. It's not that I want to do evil on Sabbath. There's good that I want to do. I want to keep working and, you know, telling people about Jesus and, you know, you know making more money for my family and doing good, you know, all, you know, ostensibly good things. But on the Sabbath day, God says, but this is the day that you are to rest, and you are to worship, and you are to be with me. And it's such a, it, it really, it's this fundamental way that we practice the virtue of justice, which, which again means that we are, putting those things in their right relationship, even with when it means on a human level, we're accepting a loss or what seems, what feels like a loss in this world. When we feel like we're failing in a worldly sense, like that's a good thing because we're, we're setting aside our wits and our efforts and we're saying that ultimately this, this has to be a matter of God's work, God's power. Um, but it, it, we have to be ready for it because in the moment, so often, doing justice means precisely setting apart those things that we would prefer to focus on and do according to our passions and to accept from God his order, you know, to do what is right and just, even when it conflicts with what we desperately want to be worrying about and, and doing right now. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen.
Yeah. And we can think about that again. So many, if we think about the big, you know, moments of, of real disunity, of schism, of heresy in the church, again, so many, so many times that's, you can kind of boil those things down to that, that you have a person who's got a, a fragment of the truth that they're really passionate about, or there's some a scandal or evil in the church that they're very, very scandalized, rightly scandalized by. And, but they allow that to, to tempt them to set aside the order of justice, which would prioritize very highly not breaking up the body of Christ, not, not leaving the church, not divorcing the marriage, but staying, staying home, staying there and working things out, allowing the Holy Spirit to work this out, to be patient, you know, to be patient and let God work things out. Oftentimes our impatience is what causes not just a uh, temporary disunity, but actual rupture in relationships that are then very, very hard to, to mend. Yeah, so true. It's it's uh, letting letting the little thing become, and it's not that that sin is little, but letting it become the dominant driving point of the relationship. You know, uh, like get, getting a rock in your your shoe, and then all of a sudden it it just it, instead of dealing with it, you, it, you're just bearing on it the whole time until you become you know infected, and you, and then you lose your foot. You know. Uh, I mean, these, these are, um, the, the little things that we let become the big things that drive the relationship. It's so easy to do that. It really is so easy to do that. And uh, that, that's why just going back to this theme of praying, you know, how do we manage the difficulty that it, that it is to live in the world as, uh, as people with other people, um, and not just fall into this division and this disunity and this injustice. Uh, praying is is a big one, and then also recognizing um, the weakness in myself as well. You know, like I may be contributing uh, big time to this problem, which is really, I think, is another point of injustice when I when I don't see my own contribution. That's why I like going back to the early episodes in this series, John Mark, when you read the section from the Catechism. That in, in which the church admits, you know, going back, for instance, to the, um, the time of the emergence of Protestantism, that it was sin in everyone's life that was, that was contributing to this problem, not just one sided. Yeah. And, um, that, that's a, that's an important thing to remember. Right. You know, another aspect of this connection between justice and unity, uh, that's, I, I, very practical is is just that in in our present situation in a divided body of Christ we have different ecclesial communities um, you know here at the Coming Home Network we're you know we're sharing the truth and beauty of the Catholic Church we're, we're helping those assisting those who are who are interested in returning to the Catholic Church but mm. but in the midst of our of our persisting disunity um, you know one of the things that that connects us to fellow believers in Christ, fellow baptized uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, and uh, allows for a unity that that's working towards greater unity, should mm-hmm. be our common commitment to doing justice, right? When you meet another person uh, who perhaps believes very different from you, they've had very different life experiences, they've been born into a different church, and so, you know, intellectually, doctrinally, you're very far from each other. But when you meet another person who loves justice, and actually, I, I, wonder, I didn't read it at the beginning, you know, but this is a, a reading from the Book of Wisdom. If anyone mm. loves righteousness, her labors are virtues, for she teaches self-control and prudence, justice and courage. Nothing in life is more profitable for men than these. When you mm. meet another person who loves righteousness, who loves justice, um, you find a kindred spirit because you find another person who, in their in their heart, is allowing themselves to be conformed to Christ. And as I think we pointed out in one of the earlier episodes, I mean that's that's the true basic basis of any of any real ecumenism that we that we have as Christians. You know, an authentic ecumenism has to be looking at what connects us as divi- as Christians, you know, who are who are divided, but working towards unity. The basis of that has to be this again this ongoing conversion to Jesus Christ, this being conformed to him, this being open for him to lead us uh, into repair. But that that love of righteousness, that that desire to, you know, insofar as I can, you know, with the light that I've been given, again, as you as you pointed out last episode, 
if I am trying to be the kind of person who puts those relationships in order and does right according to them, that's that's a a, a point of real commonality with other people. That's a that's something that binds us together with other people. Saying that this, if if we can be committed to this, to being people of justice, then God can uh, can take us further. Yeah, Amen. To to be like Jesus, that's yes. that's really what uh, this it all it all comes down to. To be like Jesus, Amen. Amen. Well, let's let's leave it there for now, Kenny. We've talked through prudence and now justice. Justice being really this peak, this heart of of virtue, of conversion, of transformation in Christ. Uh, it provides the content for the life of virtue, the, the moral life, because it it regards relationships, their order, their nature, and how we we respond according to them. And as we pointed out, you know, again in the last episode, uh, the virtues are not. They're not a system. They're not a self-help thing. They're not some technique or technology, you know, for bringing about some unity that we want to bring about. They're allowing Christ to transform us. In some sense, they're they're taking our hands off the wheel to some degree, and saying, "No, Christ, I want to be who you you created me to be. I want I want to allow uh, you to transform me." And so uh, we're going to proceed on next time to talk about the the remaining two. Uh, cardinal virtues, which are, are courage and temperance, or self-control is another, another word that's often used, or phrase that's, that's used there. And we'll see that these are really two virtues, kind of two pillars that guard justice. You know, they don't, they don't bring new content in. They, they regard the different uh, challenges that we encounter when we try to carry out the demands of justice. You know, um, uh, external uh, threats and fear and internal disunity. We'll talk through that all uh, in a future episode. But for now, we'll leave it there with with justice. Uh, Kenny, thanks again for uh, for this conversation. Look forward to doing it again next time. Yeah, thank you, John Mark. Really great, really edifying. God bless you. Yeah, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Deep in Christ. Hope it's been uh, helpful to you. We'd love to know what you think. Uh, share your thoughts uh, uh, with uh, with us on the the. Uh, series so far. Uh, I want to remind you that this is a production of the Coming Home Network International. We are here as a network of converts to the Catholic Church to share the truth in beauty and help uh, those who are considering becoming Catholic, especially pastors and missionaries, those who whose whole life is bound up in the proclamation of the gospel, but who feel the call, who hear the call by the Holy Spirit to come home to full communion with the Catholic Church. We're here to assist you, to pray for you and pray with you and to help you in any way we can. So check out chnetwork.org for resources and a newsletter and online community and many opportunities to to journey together uh, as brothers in Christ. Once again, this is Deep in Christ. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi. We'll be back again next week. God bless. 